I want to continue in our study about David. And today we're going to uh, cover several chapters in 2 Samuel. At least that's my, my hope. I don't, I don't really think we're going to get through all of this topic <clears throat> today. But I wanted to consider today some of David's troubles. And again, and just like the other things that we've looked at about David, this is, this is not just going to be like some, some history lessons, some kind of interesting things that happened in the past, but we're, we're seeing uh, the nature of David himself, of course, a man after God's own heart. We're seeing how a king that God has chosen, how he, how he lives and how he reacts to circumstances. So <clears throat> we're going to look at... Uh, I've just, uh, chapter, 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 20, basically, I've just categorized all those chapters as David's troubles. And uh, the record in uh, First Chronicles of David doesn't really record uh, all of these events. Matter of fact, most of them, I think it just leaves out. Chronicles is more of just a record of the, the military conquest of the kings, that kind of thing, but in 2 Samuel, we get more of a personal look at David and, and, and Saul, of course, too. <clears throat> so now all of these things that David went through affected him personally. <clears throat> <clears throat> so there's more to be seen here than, uh, than just that David is paying for his sin, because that's, that's kind of where this begins in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 11 and 12 is David's sin with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet coming to him and, and, and giving him the judgment of God about the situation in chapter 12 there. And then chapter 13, just a lot of trouble starts right after that. And so it's, it's very obvious from the scriptural account that, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious actually. We'll find out if you read commentators and listen to a lot of what's being said about David today, I guess it's not obvious. It it ought to be obvious that ought to be obvious that this is this is the result of David's sin. But what's what's not so obvious, I think, is that people miss how David handles it. And you know, there's a lot of accusations against David about him being a hard man and these kinds of things. Well, he's We'll see here that is not the case at all. <clears throat> so David, even though he sinned with Bathsheba, and this is a was a grievous sin, and well, we're gonna there's eight chapters here covering all this came because of his sin with Bathsheba. So as we noted in the past, David certainly did not get away with this. The Lord put away his sin, meaning that God didn't condemn him, but he didn't get by with it. So there was Many grievous, grievous things came, up, came upon David as a result of this. But <clears throat> at the same time, remember his sin with Bathsheba was after God made the promise regarding David's house, that he would make David a house and that there would not fail a man to sit on his throne and that he would establish his throne forever and ever. And David's sin with Bathsheba did not, did not cancel that. God did not repent of the promise that he gave to David. <clears throat> so, so David uh, remained tender-hearted unto his death. <clears throat> so if a person, now when a, when a person reads these accounts, <clears throat> it depends on how you, your interpretation of what you read is going to depend on what you think of David. <clears throat> because in, in this account, in the accounts, several chapters here, there's very little commentary by the Holy Spirit. This just, it's just going to be, here's what happened. And then this happened, and this person said that, and that person said this, and, and it's just going to give us account of, of these events that happened with only very rarely will the Holy Spirit comment about what's going on in the background or, or what someone is thinking. So this kind of uh, leaves it up to <clears throat> the individual person reading the scriptures, how close they are to God is what, what you can see in here and how you, uh, well, how you interpret David's heart. 
So if a person is, is automatically, you're set against David and you think he's a scoundrel, well, when you read this, it's just going to reinforce that. But if you see that, if you see David like God saw him, sees him, that he's a man after God's own heart and he will do all his will, and you see that David has a tender heart and he is the right man to be the king, then, then you'll continue to see that in, in these things that transpire too. <clears throat> so we'll begin in 2 Samuel chapter 13. <clears throat> and uh, actually before we, we go there, I want to read once more what the Lord pronounced to David after his sin with Bathsheba <clears throat> because that that has an effect on what we're going to see wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son." Now that's what the Lord said, and we're going to we're going to see that come to pass now. Yes, go ahead. He said after Nathan had told David that God put away his sin. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's a good lesson to be learned. Amen. Now it's it's better to uh, endure the punishment of God in this world and have your sin put away than have him not punish you and condemn you in the end. Right. David is paying for his sins. I've heard people right. say that. Mm -hmm. No, if David were to pay for his sins, mm -hmm. then he would have died. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David is being dealt with as a son. Yeah. Chastised. Uh -huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good point. <clears throat> so chapter 13, <clears throat> this is the, uh, the incident with three of David's children involving Amnon and Tamar, and Absalom, and we're not going to, to read all this because uh, I'm certain you're familiar with the account. I'll just read some select verses from this chapter. <clears throat> but David had 15 sons, not including sons from concubines, scriptures tell us, and only one daughter, Tamar, and it says that she was very fair. She was a beautiful young lady and a virgin. <clears throat> And Amnon was David's eldest son. So Amnon was, was the first in line to the throne. If you just go by the, the tradition, he was the firstborn son. Absalom was the thirdborn son. He was born of Maacah, who was the daughter of the king of Geshur. And Tamar was Absalom's sister, so born of the, born of the same mother. <clears throat> and you know the account, Amnon... Uh, burned with lust for his his half sister Tamar, <clears throat> and uh, he uh, this was became uh, obvious by his outward conduct. And so <clears throat> another relative, Jonadab, who was David's nephew, David's brother Shimea's son, the scriptures say he was a, a a crafty and a cunning man. He was subtle. He had a he had a sneaky, cunning way of getting whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. And he noticed that Amnon just was unpleasant looking and, and not happy. So he asked what's going on. And so Amnon tells him Am, uh, that he wants his sister Tamar. Well, Jonadab, instead of putting a stop to it, Jonadab gives him advice on how to go about getting what he wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you know the account. Uh, Amnon pretends to be sick. And David the king comes to see him because his son is sick, and he, and he says, send my sister Tamar to me to, to make some bread and to feed me. It'll make me feel better. So David sends Tamar, and, uh, and Amnon uh, forces her in the bed with him, <clears throat> and uh, then he hates her instead of loving her. But be, well, before this, Tamar, Tamar reasons with him. Tamar is like her father. She has the mind of God. She says, don't do this. This is foolish. Yeah. So I'll never be able to put away the reproach 
you'll be counted as a fool in Israel. Why not ask David to give me to you his wife? He'll do it. Yeah. No, Amnon wouldn't listen. So uh, this transpires. Absalom finds out <clears throat> about his sister and takes his sister and, and into his house, but, but does nothing. <clears throat> and David finds, about, uh, finds out about all this and, and uh, says he was very wroth. He was very angry. <clears throat> Now, I wanted to uh, reason about reason upon uh, David's reaction to this. He was angry, and rightfully so, <clears throat> and many uh, have accused him of being a bad father <clears throat> because this happened and because he did nothing about it. But uh, my, and it is opinion, again, we're, we're dealing with scripture here, which the Holy Spirit hasn't given us any commentary. Just here's what happened. But it, it at least to me seems reasonable. It's reasonable to think that David didn't do anything because he saw this was of God. This is right after, yeah. as far as the, the scriptural account, this is right after God told him what was going to happen. And he, I think he was reasoning that the, I'm not going to meddle with this because this is God told me trouble was coming. I may be wrong. That's, that's just my opinion. But it, it, I think it's at least reasonable. <clears throat> I'd rather think that than accuse David of, of being a wicked man, his brother. We have a similar reasoning in the scriptures where someone called him a bloody, bloody man. He said, well, God told him to curse yeah, David. That's so, right. I mean, that is in the scripture. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah, this is how you treat people that criticize you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And there's no, no sin in this matter attributed to David in the scripture. So we shouldn't, no one should feel they have the liberty to accuse where God has not accused. Yeah. Well, I say that David, like the holy man of old, knew when to do something and when not to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. There are, are situations where it is... It's not good to be hasty. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just so bad. Yeah. It's hard to sort through it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know immediately what is the best thing to do. Yeah. And in those times, it may look like inactivity, but there, there's a lot going on. We don't, we don't know what the outworking would have been if Absalom hadn't taken it into to his own hands. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that that David, he, even though Absalom fled and David didn't go after him to bring him back into the house, that uh, he didn't go after Absalom either because he had he had avenged a wrong, mm -hmm. and so he didn't he wasn't like proactive to go after Absalom to punish him either for what mm -hmm. he did. Yeah. But this was the, you're right. The fact that God had said something, I could see David waiting mm -hmm. to be able to sort it out. Yeah. He wasn't a he wasn't a person of inactivity. Yeah. If he had seen this needs to be avenged, this needs to be corrected, this mm -hmm. David would have done it if yeah. he'd have had a clear direction on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes it it just takes time for for us to be clear about what the Lord would would have done. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, that even in my own experience, there were times where I strongly suspected something wasn't right, but I had no no physical proof of it, mm -hmm. and I knew it was more a matter of the heart of a person than just being able to you know find out this that or the other and um, perhaps the Lord working in them to give them space to repent. And it looked like there was mm -hmm. nothing being done. Yeah. But in that interim, there were a yeah. lot of prayers, there mm -hmm. was a lot of searching, there was a That's lot right. of, you know, there was activity. Mm -hmm. It just, there wasn't an immediate solution. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's wise not to be hasty. I've read some comments about this, and I wanted to bring it up for the sake of the young people, if they would read these comments in anything in the future. Because they seem to be to be a 
more of a psychological analysis mm -hmm. of this oh, yeah. matter, uh -huh. yeah. which is inappropriate since you've already mentioned the Holy Spirit doesn't comment, it just gives, he just gives the facts. Mm -hmm. And that is, some say, have said that David was not able to react because of his own guilt mm -hmm. of the sin with you in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That's mm -hmm. how the Holy Spirit describes this. Mm -hmm. yeah. The matter of Uriah the Hittite. And so that's why he couldn't he didn't or couldn't deal with Ammon over this matter because he was guilty himself. And he wasn't put to death by God, so he didn't put Ammon to death. Mm. But that seems to be a human yeah. psycho babble analysis to me. Mm -hmm. yes. More than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Spirit doesn't tell us why. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know David, he wasn't uh, wishy washy. So he did order the death of other people right. immediately when he, he knew wasn't him. the type of man that just backed off for backing off sake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He wasn't this kind of person. Or going forward just to go and kill him. This is the kind of person that's very rare, you understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in the mass of humanity, there's just a few person here or there that is this kind of person. Mm -hmm. Women, like Simeon and Levi destroyed a whole city over That's right. See, they yeah. couldn't. In their rations, yeah. That's right. I was saying, we, we, we live in a present generation of the ungodly who said, you have no right, right. to judge. Yeah. And, of course, that's led over into the church. Mm -hmm. I've been told that. Mm -hmm. You have no right to judge. You're not the judge. And it's a good thing you're not the judge. Things like that. When, when you simply pronounce what God has pronounced mm -hmm. in the matter. So, uh, we have a lot more revelation than David did. Yeah. A lot more revelation than this, the writer of this record had mm -hmm. about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you notice that David wasn't moved by uh, what he thought the people would think either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that gives me to think that he was waiting on the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, doubtless there was. He was... He was he was dealing with what God had said, but it wasn't like a paralyzing thing. It was more like a purifying thing if that was going on. Mm -hmm. That he would thoroughly repent and know what God was doing and mm -hmm. humble himself before the Lord, find direction on, on what to do, see what God was doing. Those would have been the activities. Even if even if you know people say, well, the people would have thought this or the pe that that's not what motivated David. Mm -hmm. It was what God was doing. Mm -hmm. And he was the king. And he wasn't going to add to his transgression. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. David was a very wise man. Well this this situation just as we where we ended here, this just remained status quo for two full years. And nothing was done about it. And Absalom, we know, was just biding his time. He was looking for opportunity to take revenge uh, on Amnon for his sister. <clears throat> and so the time came, and he uh, had some sheep shears that were shearing the sheep. And this, this was apparently like a time of feasting when this happened. So he decided to invite uh, David and all the king's sons to his place, to the feast for the sheep shearing. And David, of course, declined, said, no, I, I'm not going to go. But uh, Absalom pressed him, insisted that he allow Amnon and his other brothers to come. So they did, and, and you know what happened there, that uh, Amnon was slain during the feast. <clears throat> All David's other sons fled and went back to Jerusalem, and Am, er, uh, Absalom fled, and he went back to his, his mother's family, the king of Geshur. That's where he fled to. And uh, at first, David got news, the, the first news David got was that all of his sons had been slain. And then Jonadab happens to be there, and he pops into the scene again and says, no, no, all, all your sons aren't dead, it's only Amnon. Well, Jonadab wasn't there. How does he know this? It's because he's, he's been privy to this all along. He knew all along that Absalom was conspiring and he knew all along what was, was going to happen. So uh, the reason I, I give those details is to show you how, how much trouble 
can come upon you from, you know, this, this involves three of David's children and one of his nephews, all kind of royal family. This is, this is the royal family in Israel, God's people, right? So David's got a lot of things to consider here. This is a weighty matter, very, very perplexing, very troubling, this kind of thing. And now, now one of his sons has killed another of his sons who happened to be next in line to the throne. There's a lot of trouble here. But David, David maintains his integrity throughout this. <clears throat> Yes. I, my comment wasn't very clear. I apologize for that. I, what I was trying to say by referring to the fact that Nathan had said that God had purged his sin, and yet here are these consequences, is that men have this idea that once you're forgiven, there's no more consequences mm -hmm. yeah. for your actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I want uh, what I want to say is that there are still consequences, but they don't have redemptive value. You're right. Not, that's right. You're not right. Right. That's, right. that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah, but people they get sin. upset mm -hmm. that you know they 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 confess their sin, these things, and then they face these difficulties, yeah. and they don't know how to deal with the, mm -hmm. these things. And it's like they've forgotten that God deal with you as with sons. That's yeah. right. Uh -huh. And and so they're not able to appropriately handle the difficulties. But now. It is the knowledge that David has that he's being dealt with as a son that helps him be humble and submit to this. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's and right. not be prideful right. yeah. as if God owes us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is not the case. So I hope I hope that's a little clearer. I, yeah. I definitely don't want to get the notion that, you know, okay, there are no consequences, you know, that, mm -hmm. that come about because people have that mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. that's right. There are. Amen. Yeah. In order that you might be a partaker of his holiness, yeah, there are right. consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> Amen. Very well. We understand. Sin, mm -hmm. sin can be forgiven, but for it to be boiled out of your soul, that's right. another matter. Amen. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Amen. The right. Apostle Paul saw that. He said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. He understood this concept. Mm -hmm. Now, I've noticed, I've noticed over the years that people that were converted from a very unseemly background will tend to be hard with other people who are, instead of remembering they were redeemed from it, they'll be yeah. hypercritical of other people not realizing what will happen to them. It was one of the first things Jesus told us all the time was to analyze was, I'll show you what great things you must see yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say what great things you must suffer yeah. for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And the, uh, moving on to the 14th chapter, we're just going to, actually I considered not even discussing the 13th and 14th chapter because I, we're going to spend most of our time in chapter 15, but um, I, did, I did want to stir up your hearts to think about the trouble that David encountered and how he dealt with it. These are necessary things to consider. Now in, in chapter 14, Absalom has been, been gone for three years. Amnon, of course, is dead. And, and the last part of chapter 13 says that David was comforted concerning Amnon. And again, there's speculation about what exactly does that mean. Does that mean that just some time went on and it finally wore off that his son was dead? Or, or was it perhaps that uh, he saw that, that Absalom, what Absalom did was, was, in a sense, it was right. He avenged his sister. So he, he's longing for Absalom and he's comforted concerning Amnon. That's just what it says. And... Uh, <clears throat> Joab detects that David is longing for Absalom, so Joab just takes it upon himself to uh, go get Absalom. And, well, he, he wanted to. So he sends this woman of Tekoa to David and tells her this kind of a, this yarn to spin before David. Similar, I don't know if maybe Absalom was, or uh, Joab was thinking about when Nathan the prophet perhaps came to David and told the, the, the fable about a man that had one sheep and his neighbor came and took his sheep. And I don't, maybe that's what Joab was thinking. I don't know. But he sent this woman to tell this tale to David that she was a widow and had two sons and one son killed the other and now she has no family and et cetera, et cetera. 
And, and David detected right away what's going on. And he says, tell me the truth. Joab put you up to this, didn't he? And the woman says, I can't hide anything from you. You know, David the king, you know exactly what's going on. And so uh, David agrees to have Absalom brought back to Jerusalem, but he's got to, to go to his house. He's not to be brought before the king. And so Joab gets him, brings him back, and then Absalom's in Jerusalem for two years, and he wants to see the king. And uh, <clears throat> this is when he, he calls for Joab two times, and Joab doesn't come to him, so he burns Joab's barley fields to get his attention. And uh, then Joab brings Absalom before the king. And uh, while Absalom is back in Jerusalem, we can detect from the scriptural record here that automatically his intentions are not good. <clears throat> in uh let's see I didn't write these verses down in verse 25 chapter 14 verse 25 it there were it says that in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. And uh, tells about Absalom's children that were born in Jerusalem. And uh, that... Uh, Absalom, basically, he, what we kind of read between the lines is he's winning over the hearts of the people. Like, like who cares about the king's son's hair? Is that really that important? I, I just, I picture this in my mind. Oh, Absalom's cutting his hair again. Oh, how much will it weigh this year? Like, is this really important? But this is, this is the kind of man he's in, he is. He's, he's a good-looking man. Everyone loves Absalom. And we even, we want to see him get his hair cut. You know, it's so, he's so wonderful. Well, this is, he's winning the hearts of the people over here. We see he's, he's conspiring already very subtly, but that's what he's doing. And then we get to chapter 15 and it really, it really starts to come out more. Now he's, whenever he comes through the city, he's in a, in a chariot and he's got 50 men running before him. So it's a, he's making a big show and he goes to the gate, the king's gate and whenever anyone comes for a, a matter for David to judge, Absalom stops him. Hey, it, there's no one to take care of you. I'll do it. I'll, I'll see to your needs. I'll judge in this matter. I'll help you out. And he says he'd take him by the hand and he'd, and he'd kiss every one of them. So he's, he's gradually winning over the hearts of the people to himself. Uh, un, I, at least some of it was unbeknownst to David. He's, he's doing this in a sneaky, cunning manner. <clears throat> He says in chapter 15, verse 4, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would, I would do him justice. So, verse 6 says, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. <clears throat> Didn't win them, he stole them. <clears throat> An important word. <clears throat> That's right. That's right. Amen. That's right. Uh -huh. The Lord's anointed. Yeah. <clears throat> Even after Saul's death, David had honor uh -huh. for Saul mm -hmm. for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, now the time comes in chapter 15 where where Absalom is is ready to make his move. He's going to attempt to usurp the throne from David. And so what he tells David was that while I was in exile. Back in, in with the king of Geshur, while I was in exile, I made a vow to the Lord that if he brought me back to Jerusalem, I would serve him. And now I'm, I'm going to, I want to do that. I'm going to go to Hebron and I'm, I'm going to pay my vow before the Lord. And so, Dave, well, this is, David doesn't know any better. He said, well, this is a good thing. The Lord bless you in this son. And Absalom asked for 200 men from Jerusalem to come with him, kind of an entourage, and the scriptures tell us these 200 men didn't know what was going on either. They, they didn't know what, what Absalom had planned. <clears throat> so Absalom and his men, they go to Hebron. And what Absalom has done, he's, 
he's sent out spies out to all the tribes of Israel. And the plan is that when he gets to Hebron, he's going to be declared king and he's going to sound a trumpet and all these spies and all the other tribes are going to announce to all the people in the land that Absalom is king. Now them, them being ignorant of his conspiracy, they're, they're going to think this is legitimate. They're going to think David's, David's given the throne to Absalom already. And so they'll, they'll join with him and think that Absalom's really the king. Now that's the plan anyway. Well, uh, he, he goes to Hebron, chapter 15, verse 12 says, And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. That's not necessarily all the people, but he did have a strong following. He had won a lot of the people over to himself. <clears throat> and there came a messenger to David, saying... <clears throat> The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. That seems to be like a, that's a rather hasty decision. Like, David didn't, pray about it. He didn't seek the Lord or ask for a prophet or a seer to come. He didn't take some time to consider just immediately his word as arise, let us flee. Remember now, this is, this is King David. David who slew the lion and the bear. David who slew the giant Goliath and, and carried his head to Jerusalem. This is David, the anointed of God, a man after God's own heart, David, who has slain his tens of thousands. And he says, arise, let us flee. Why, why did he do that? Because he remembered. He remembered his sin. And he knew what God was doing. Amen. So he submitted himself. <clears throat> Very tender-hearted man, David was. The opposite of self-centered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, amen. And his, and his thoughts were for the city. See, because if we, if we stay here and fight, well, Absalom's going to come against the holy city. Yeah. He, he's fleeing the city of David. Keep that in mind, too. The city of God. Absalom, Absalom's going to come and, and destroy the people and the city. So David, as, again, this is a good king now. Yes. His mind is for the city of God. And for the people, he doesn't have to think long about this. To rise and let us flee. Yes. Jason. <clears throat> this wasn't completely out of character for David because he, he had also, he had not chosen to fight Saul. That's right. He, he, had, he had run and hid from Saul, but not out of cowardice. That's mm -hmm. right. The, 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 the thinking of David was Saul, and I think the same thing was going on here is that David was willing to wait and let the Lord right. <clears throat> take care of the situation without him taking control of the situation. That's right. So you, you, there are situations in life that come up where you can say, I'm going to handle this, mm -hmm. I'm going to take control of this, and I'm going to have my way. And that's when we get in even more trouble sometimes in the original situation. Mm -hmm. David's, David's not, he's not a coward. Like you said, oh, no. he's a warrior. <clears throat> yeah. yes. But... Like he did with Saul, mm -hmm. he's saying, I'm going to let the Lord work mm -hmm. this thing out. Yes. Amen. 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 Right. Yeah, as Brother <clears throat> Jason was speaking, I was just thinking about how, yeah, David wasn't a coward. He's already, he already proved himself that way. He, yeah. we, we already know that. But uh, more than anything else, he really does care about the name of the Lord mm -hmm. and God's people. See, this is where some people I see get in trouble is because they don't really care about the name of the Lord. Yeah. They care more about their own name than the Lord. David is sincere and really caring for about what people think about the Lord and in, in his people. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> the people who are sensitive to God often do things that appear to make no sense to the rest of the world. <clears throat> Now, you, now, of course, you have to think of your own self like this, too. That's really the thing to be seen here, is to, to remember when trouble comes upon you, that you might remember your own sin. 
and not not to be overly sorrowful that not that kind of thing but to know that God is just and that he's merciful and that that he chastises every one of his sons and to you know we we bow our heads in humility and submit to God like David did I particularly uh, I read Adam Clark's commentary on this verse and I wanted to read that to you cuz it uh, he stated a lot better my thoughts than I can state. Adam Clark, David said, arise, let us flee. This, I believe, was the first time that David turned his back to his enemies. And why did he now flee? Jerusalem, far from not being in a state to sustain a siege, was so strong that even the blind and the lame were supposed to be a sufficient defense for the walls and he had still with him his faithful Cherethites and Pelethites, besides 600 faithful Gittites who were perfectly willing to follow his fortunes. There does not appear any reason why such a person in such circumstances should not act on the defensive, at least till he should be fully satisfied of the real complexion of affairs. But he appears to take all as coming from the hand of God, therefore he humbles himself weeps, goes barefoot, and covers his head. He does not even hasten his departure, for the habit of mourners is not the habit of those who are flying before the face of their enemies. He sees the storm, and he yields to what he conceives to be the tempest of the Almighty. Amen. But now I want some, there's a lot of good things to see here in this chapter. Now David, <clears throat> there's, this is a cause for, for great grief and sorrow now that here his own son is going to usurp the throne. David knows it's because of his own sin. He and his mighty men, the people are leaving, leaving the city of David. Now there's a, uh, a lot of cause for sorrow and grief here, but, and you know this from your own experience, the Lord will, will season your grief with a lot of mercies too. So we want to see some mercies here. First of all, he's not leaving the city alone. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 16. And the king went forth and all his household after him. And the king left ten women which were concubines to keep the house. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was far off. <clears throat> now my understanding, this uh, statement, tarried in a place that was far off, this, this is what David did. Like he, he left the house or his palace and went away, and he stood and stopped and waited, waited for all the people to come by. Because it says the next verse, I believe, that they, they passed by. So he, he stands and he waits for all the people. Verse 18, and all his servants passed on beside him. And all the Cherethites and all the Pelethites and the Gittites, 600 men which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then said the king to Ittai, the Gittite, if you remember the record of David's mighty men, this is, this is one of his, I believe it was the 30 mighties. <clears throat> Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. The Gittite, as you remember, the Gittites were from Gath. This, these 600 men were from the same city as Goliath, yet they, they left to follow David. <clears throat> Whereas thou camest but yesterday... Should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Seeing I go whither I may. In other words, I don't even know where I'm going. You return thou. Go back. Take back thy brother. And mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. And David said to Ittai, go and pass over. That is, pass over the brook Kidron. Now he says, all right, you, you come along with us. If that's, that's the manner of your heart, then, then come with us. Go and pass over. And Ittai the Gittite passed over, and all his men and all the little ones that were with them. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. So this was, this was a, a great comfort to David, no doubt, to have all these people. He still had loyal 
people in Jerusalem who loved him and followed him, and all of his mighty men, just, just the Gittites were 600. That's, that's not including the Cherethites and the Pelethites. But his mighty men followed him and uh, were very loyal to him. So you'll, uh, you'll note in your trouble, I've noticed this in, in my own trouble, that God will, will, will send these little mercies. Because, see, when you're in, you're in trouble, the temptation is to think that everything is trouble. And sometimes it does seem like that. The temptation is to think that God's very angry with me. He's not going to hear my prayers. He's not going to give me any blessings. He's not going to give me any mercies. He's just going to ignore me. This is the temptation for you to think this. But God won't, he won't allow it. He'll, in, in your trouble, he'll, he'll send these mercies like this to let you know, I, I don't hate you. I'm chastising you. I'm, I'm not taking the chastisement away, but I'm going to be merciful to you. You're still my son. Amen. He'll let you know this. And uh, some more important details in verse 24. Lo, Zadok also and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. <clears throat> Abiathar was the high priest. So here even, this shows you the love that the people had for David. They even, the, the priests and the Levites even took the ark, and they're, they're going to take the ark with David. And Abiathar, the high priest, uh, my understanding is when it says he, he went up, he, he kind of did what David did. He went up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and, and watched as the, all the people came out of the city. They set the ark down, and the high priest went up. I, it's kind of a, I wish I saw, I could see more in there, but that, that seems to be quite a picture to me, to have the high priest on top of the Mount of Olives, looking over the city, watching the people, until they all get out safely. <clears throat> but the king, he says unto Zadok in verse 25, carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am, let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Now that, uh, the Lord's chastising should have that effect on all of us too. <clears throat> When you, you know the Lord's chastising you because you're, you're in need of perfection. Amen. And uh, there's, you know, a Adam's nature will cause you to rebel and will, will push you to uh, say, I don't deserve this. Yeah. You know, I ought, I ought to be treated better. You know, I, and this and that and the other, and it'll cause you to be proud. But, but here's what David said, let the Lord do unto me whatever seemeth him good. If the Lord, if the Lord, well, what, what are you going to circumvent what God's going to do? Is there anything you can do about it anyway? If the Lord's pleased with me, he'll bring me back here. Take, take the ark back. It doesn't belong with me. Yeah. See, David, David's humility, that, this isn't my ark. Yeah. It doesn't belong to me. It, that, it belongs there in the city of God, in his tabernacle. Take the ark back. And if God's pleased with me, I'll see it again and his habitation. So the Lord, let the Lord do whatever seems unto him good. Amen. This is, I, from my own experience, this is hard to do sometimes. But this, this is what the people of God, this is what we ought to be known for, yeah, is to have this mind and this attitude. Let the Lord do unto me what seems good to him. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Remember when Paul was on his way at he was going to be taken cab go to Rome, the prisoner, and so the prophets. So on the way, the prophets told him, yep. and they interpret. Mm -hmm. But they interpreted them. The prophecies were true, but they interpreted mm -hmm. them to mean he shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. And when they saw he couldn't be persuaded, they said, "The will of the Lord be done." That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a sign of wisdom when you're mm -hmm. able to detect. Yep. Sometimes there is some kind of persuading that should be done, but then there's, mm -hmm. there's some things got in and the will of the mm -hmm. Lord be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, now, 
If you uh, you try to picture yourself in this situation, there's a lot of lot of trouble going on. But you notice David David's thinking very clearly here. He's not all confused and bewildered and and wondering what he should do. He's thinking his thinking is crystal clear. He's he's in tune with God. He we're seeing demonstrated here again that he is indeed a, a man after God's own heart. He knows what's going on, even in the midst of this great trouble. <clears throat> and again, I want to emphasize that his heart was for Jerusalem and for the people. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. <clears throat> So, so David tells the priest to send the ark back. <clears throat> and likewise, he tells the priest, you go back too, to Zadok and Abiathar. <clears throat> he says, because, again, that's, that's where your ministry is. The ministry is there serving God. You're, you're not to serve me. You're to serve God. That's what he chose you for. <clears throat> and a second benefit from that was that... Uh, Zadok and Abiathar and their two sons would be David's eyes and ears in the city to let him know what was happening when Absalom came to the city. So you see here all these, all these mercies of the Lord. He's chastising David, and he's, he's being very merciful to him at the same time. Brother Jason. Yeah, maybe another difference between, we see another difference here between Saul and David again. Saul, it seems to me, was what we would call a pragmatist. A, pra a pragmatist means whatever works. I don't. Does, the means doesn't matter as long as I have this desired end. You know, Saul often treated the Lord and Samuel that way. I was thinking of when Saul's waiting on Samuel mm -hmm. to come and sacrifice before they go into battle, mm -hmm. and Saul and Samuel was late, mm -hmm. and so Saul says, "Well, I'll just offer it yeah. myself." Mm -hmm. so he just he's just pra he's just a pragmatist. I'm just going to. I'm going to do whatever I can do to make the desired end come out the way that I you know, want it to come out. Yeah. Now, if, if David had thought that way, you would definitely want to take the ark with you. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we take the ark, remember the story of the ark and the Philistines? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, the, oh, the ark of God's in the camp. We're in trouble now, you know. Mm -hmm. that, let's take God with us mm -hmm. because, you know. God will give us success. He'll, David didn't think that way at all. Right. He wasn't thinking pragmatically at all. Mm -hmm. Totally different kind of man mm -hmm. than his predecessor. Mm -hmm. yes. Not a, not a pra a lot of people a lot of people think about God this way, especially when they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now we need religion. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Because we definitely want to get out of this mess yeah. and come out smelling like a rose. See, that's a totally different mindset right. than what David than what David had. Yeah. Very selflessness is very well demonstrated in this account. The key point is that in the midst of trouble, to think straight. Yes. Yes. This is a sign of some maturity. That's right. All of those people should have not fall apart when they were trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, David, at this point, uh, he knows uh, what's what's happening, but he, he doesn't know if he's going to come back to Jerusalem or not. He doesn't know these things. For all he knows, Absalom's going to come in and set up his king, and, and he may remain king until David's death. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know what's going to happen. So that, that gives more uh, importance to the way he's reasoning and what he says here, how he's thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is very grievous, <clears throat> uh, yet David is reasoning, reasoning properly, reasoning according to the will of the Lord. Now in verse... Uh, Fifth, or I'm sorry, Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 31. A bit of news comes to David, and one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Here's another thing that you ought to know. When you're, when you're being chastised of the Lord, when you're in a lot of trouble, you, you know you can pray, right? 
and you know he w he he will hear your prayers. David David's being chastised. This is very grievous. He's not afraid to pray. Lord, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And, and we know the Lord heard his prayer. The Lord did it. So don't forget that now in your trouble. Don't, again, don't, don't think that, that God hates you and he's, he's rejected you when you're being chastised. Remember these things. <clears throat> he sti he sti still hears you. <clears throat> now Ahithophel was... David's chief counselor, there's not a whole lot said about him in Scripture. Actually, this is the first time he's mentioned right here. But we get the idea, and uh, actually in the, I think it's the last verse of chapter 15, says that in those days, maybe it was 16. Yeah, the last chapter, of, last verse of chapter 16 says the counsel of Ahithophel was as the as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. <clears throat> so this is a very wise and trusted man. This is one of David's counselors. Well, he just very easily, he just turns and goes, goes to Absalom without any loyalty or giving any thought to David, the man of God. He just, Absalom calls for him in Hebrew, and he just goes, and, and Ahithophel gives him a counsel to help Absalom do what he wants to do. <clears throat> So he's a very, very trusted man. So this is why David prays. He knows that, that all Israel uh, trusts Ahithophel, so he just asks God, just turn his counsel into foolishness yeah. so they don't listen to him, <clears throat> which the Lord does. <clears throat> yes? Yeah, and the way he does it is unique, too. He doesn't make the counsel wrong. He makes mm -hmm. the man not take it. Yep. That's, mm -hmm. that's it. very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he sends his own counselor, too. That helped, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, back in chapter 15, verse 32, and it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount, that's the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem, where he worshipped God, behold, here, here's another blessing now, another mercy comes to David. Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head, unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king. As I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now be thy servant. Then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. And hast thou not here with thee Zadok and Abiathar the priests? Therefore it shall be that what thing soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimeaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them ye shall send unto me everything that ye can hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. So now, <clears throat> here's another one of David's uh, David's friend that is in the city, going to be in the city with Absalom <clears throat> to pass along information, and he's going to counsel against whatever Ahithophel says. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is coming, how this works out. Let's see what, we've got a few minutes left. We'll go into chapter 16. <clears throat> now, uh, you know that in times of trouble, yes, the Lord is merciful, and He is good to us as He chastises us, but then when you're in trouble, you've also found that there's all kinds of people show up on the spot, <clears throat> some of whom just kind of complicate your trouble and make it worse. So, so here they come. Here come some of them now to David in chapter 16. First is Ziba, who was originally one of Saul's servants. And when uh, David took uh, Mephibosheth, who was lame, you know, in, into his own house, he put Ziba in charge of basically everything that was Mephibosheth's because Mephibosheth couldn't take care of it, so he gave it to Ziba. Well, now, all of a sudden, Ziba shows up with David, and he's brought with him uh, two asses. <clears throat> Verse 1, Ziba, the servant, servant of Mephibosheth, Ziba the servant of Mephibosheth, 
met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread and a hundred bunches of raisins and a hundred of summer fruits and a bottle of wine. And David asked, well, what, what's all this about? And he says, well, the, the donkeys are for you to ride and the food and the wines for the people. It seems like a very nice thing to do. But, but David, he, he's a wise man. He, he asks, where's Mephibosheth? Yeah, you're supposed to be taking care of Mephibosheth. Where is he at? And Ziba lies. He, he's, he's there to deceive. He, he tells David that Mephibosheth stayed in Jerusalem thinking that now that, that you're gone, the kingdom's going to be, Saul's kingdom's going to be restored, and Mephibosheth's going to be an important person again. That's, it was a lie, but that's what Ziba told David. And uh, David didn't know any better, at least not at this time. And so he says, whatever belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. It's all yours now. <clears throat> and then we just move on. The Holy Spirit, again, doesn't make any commentary about that at this point. <clears throat> And then after Ziba, David goes a little further, and now the, the infamous Shimei yeah. appears on the scene. The, just, uh, I picture he's just acting like a crazy man. Yeah. says he shows up, and he's shouting at David, and he's throwing rocks at him and, and cursing him, and he, and he just follows along. It's not like just for a second or two, for, for some distance, he just follows along beside them, cursing David and throwing stones and dust at him like a madman. And one of David's mighty men, Abishai, <clears throat> says to David <clears throat> in verse 9, 2 Samuel 16, 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse. Because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? So here again, David, this is... Uh, Shimei is just acting like a crazy man, and David just very, very calmly, because he's submitted to the Lord, he just takes it in stride, and he's and he was right. He was right to do this. Said the Lord, the Lord said to him, "Curse David, leave him alone." This uh, is a little side note here. He says, "What have I to do with thee, ye sons of Zeruiah?" Abishai was Joab's brother. <clears throat> and they had a third brother. His name escapes me right now, but, but he's, at this point, the third brother's already dead. But these three brothers, they were just, they were like killing machines. You just read the account here, it's like they had no, no particular loyalty to anyone. They just, it, it appears, they just really enjoyed killing, and that's what they did very well. So David, I, what, do I, what do I have to do with you? That's none of my business. You know, the Lord, the Lord's in control of this. He sent Shimei, now just, you just let him curse. Get in line and leave him alone. Let him curse. <clears throat> and then he says, uh, verse 11, David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth out of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hill's side over against him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and cast dust. One thing I wanted to point out here again is <clears throat> Shimei's a Benjamite, the same tribe as Saul. And see, this, this sectarianism continues even this many years later, and I, there's going to be more after this. There's still these people that, that Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and we're the ones that ought to have the kingship in our house. And there's these, still these people. You've met them too. Doesn't matter how much the Lord blesses you. Doesn't matter what's going on. You don't belong to our sect. You're not one of us. And, and we're not having fellowship together. 
at which these things grieve us. There, because there's people, not, thankfully not everyone's like this, but every once in a while you'll meet someone like this that maybe you'll, you detect something they say that, oh, there's a believer. Let's talk about the scripture or something. And as you talk along, pretty soon they find out you're not one of, you don't belong to the, the denomination I belong yeah. to. See ya. We're done. Yeah. I don't want to talk to you. You believe this. This is the same kind of thing here with these people of Benjamin. Some of them were, were bent on this Saul was king and, and the Benjamites should, should be the ones that are the king. So here's Shimei. <clears throat> but David, again, he's thinking very clearly. He's reasoning very well here. Just, again, let the Lord do to me whatever seems good to him. It could be that if I, if I just humbly take this that Shimei's dishing out, the Lord will pay me back for it. Amen. The bottom. Yeah, this also shows that um, the Lord does use all of, all the people for something. You definitely don't want to be used like Shimei. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Definitely not. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so then here in the, the end of chapter 16, <clears throat> Absalom comes to Jerusalem, and Hushai, uh, David's friend, succeeds in, in getting close to Absalom and convincing Absalom that he's going to serve him as he served his father. <clears throat> and Ahithophel, immediately when Absalom gets to Jerusalem, he, uh, he asks Ahithophel's counsel, and Ahithophel's first counsel is to lie with David's concubines in, in the sight of all Israel. So that's what they do. They, they set up a tent on the rooftop, and Absalom does this thing in the sight of all Israel. That's Ab, uh, Ahithophel's first counsel. Yeah, that's something that God said to him that he'd do. Yes, it's a fulfillment of the word of Nathan. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of alarming to me, but I've noticed that too many Christians fall apart when things aren't working well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's definitely something to seek grace because David didn't have what we have. Yeah, amen. amen. But he did. He was he responded correctly to trouble, and that is a that's a big index. That's mm-hmm. a that's a big index yes. in the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so there's a, I suppose you could say there's a little bit of irony here in what transpired because in the, I, I think it was Matthew Henry, one of the commentators pointed this out that in the very same place where David first looked upon Bathsheba that's where Solomon or Solomon this is where Absalom did this thing this wicked thing which is the fulfillment of the word of the Lord <clears throat> I think we'll stop there at the end of chapter 16 is there uh, any other observations or anything you'd like to share with us before we close mm-hmm. um. I think a lot of people get lost in these Old Testament narratives. Um, people read these passages and they, they kind of think, why is this in the Bible? This is an interesting story, but why, why is this in the Bible? And one reason, there may be multiple reasons why these are recorded, obviously, but one, one reason I think these, these kind of things are recorded is we have to remember that Along through the history that we read in the Old Testament, God at certain points had revealed certain things about His purpose. Like beginning in Genesis chapter 12, He told He gave Abraham this tremendous promise. Mm-hmm. Well, as you keep reading the narrative of Genesis, things get bad. After God revealed this wonderful yeah. promise, there's yeah. all these bad things that happen. To, to God's people, to Abraham and his family, yes. mm-hmm. and you, you, and then you come, you get to David's life, and David had just received this wonderful promise: "I'm going to build you a house mm-hmm. and everything." And then all these, all these bad things happen. Mm-hmm. 
And one of the things that's going on in Scripture is that it's being illustrated for us that man's that the promise of God does not depend on man. And so, is is any of this? See, David, David is the the Christ is going to come from this man. And here, all these bad things are happening to him. Everybody seems to be against him. He's run out of his own city. So you you want to ask? You kind of ask the question: Does this mean God's promise maybe is going to fail? No, no, it's not going to fail. Amen. That's one of the things that's illustrated all through these Old Testament narratives: is that human sin and failure does not negate the promise and the purpose of God. Amen. 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 Yeah. Very good. Amen. So, Jonathan. I do want to give thanks on your, your for your series of lessons on these kind of subjects because mm-hmm. I have heard preachers like on the radio and such preach on these texts, but rarely ever can I listen to the whole lesson because yeah. a lot of it is just derogatory mm-hmm. remarks about the saints of God. So I mean, it is a sparse thing for people to handle passages in this way and like, get encouragement from it rather than having to overcome. So I'm, I'm thankful you handled it the way you did. And mm-hmm. These were. These were good things that you brought to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Amen. You. I want to mention about this matter of <clears throat> acting rashly. Even even when uh, when we know something's wrong, you know, some, there's sin involved and so forth, we'd all be dead if God had acted rashly toward yeah. our sin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Every one of us have... Uh, Partaken of God's mercy, mm-hmm. kindness, and patience, not tolerance. David didn't didn't get any tolerance from God in, in the sense that men need tolerance now. Right. Mm-hmm. He's overlooking it. He didn't overlook it. Yeah. But he was patient in dealing with it and he dealt with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, David had a hatred for the workers of iniquity. He expressed it in the song. But to act upon it, see, to act upon it, that's just something else. Mm-hmm. He saw the hand of God in all of this. Now, I think I, I can begin to see it a little clearer, like the rationale behind spiritual babble. Mm-hmm. Why it's been allowed. There's a living proof that if God's not in the mix, It'll go, it'll go haywire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even though the people might have all the external signs like Israel, you know, mm-hmm. but if God's not active in the in the process itself, if God's not active, it'll go, it'll veer off, it'll get off course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. And it's a it's a very difficult lesson for for people to learn. Because when trouble comes, see they 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 think as though it was during purpose I was during off course. That's their response to trouble. Mm-hmm. They forget. I can see that. Some people, if there's an announcement, you know, your your wife has cancer. But there's some people that like just collapse. Mm-hmm. And there's other people that go straight to the Lord about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. The outcome of it, that's, that's something else. you got to respond to it. But see, there's this, in Babylon, cultures of people that fall apart. That, mm-hmm. yeah. That's why it's got to have recovery. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's why yeah. it's got to have that's it. That's right. It's got to have it because as soon as things aren't like they thought they were going to be, that's what trouble is. It's not what you thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Then they, they collapse and fall apart. And they think crooked and they don't think right. They think rationally. Some people, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. Well, it would be more rational for us to, to whom it's not happening and say, why isn't this happening to us? Yeah. That would be more rational. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I was Brother Gene say what he just said about the Lord doesn't act rationally with us. Yeah. And there's, there are traits of the Lord you can see in David. And I know this wasn't particularly covered in this lesson, but Absalom eventually did face defeat and was his life was taken. Yeah. But it, David wasn't just praising God when Absalom right. died. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He, actually, he, made, he made requests like spare him. Uh-huh. Be merciful to him. Yeah. 
And you know those those orders were not honored. But yeah, you could see that that like in these other situations, remember he didn't do anything. Like you remember, David was a merciful man too, yes. as well as a man of judgment, a man that honored the Lord. He was a warrior, but he was also merciful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, it's so it's such a wonderful thing to see David maintain a God consciousness throughout all these things. Mm -hmm. To worship God, to acknowledge the ways of God, to be able to still see those things throughout this difficult time for him, because that's part of what's involved in enduring chastening. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you maintain that there are greater repercussions to sin than what's happening directly to us. Mm -hmm. Whether it's we mm -hmm. have sinned or whether it's others that are sinning and now we're we're suffering mm -hmm. as a result. There's greater repercussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm thankful to see that in David. That's you'll have to fight. Obviously, when you're in a time of difficulty, of becoming self-centered, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you're yeah. tracing back to yourself. Yeah, that's right. Because you can't reason soundly that way. Mm -hmm. You're not. None of us are that important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Very good, oh, Jason. Yeah, the the hero of the narrative is is not David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's Lord. That's right. Amen. That's right. And, and David is. David is acting in concert with God. That's right. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot of people forget when they read the Bible. People read the Bibles, the Bible's about us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's why a lot of these mis these, these bad interpretations, mm -hmm. because people go in, they psychoanalyze the characters in the Bible because they're reading yeah. the Bible as if the Bible's about David mm -hmm. or the Bible's somehow about me and my problems. Yeah. But that's not what this narrative is Amen. about. Right? Yeah. God is the one who raised David up. Yeah. David was a shepherd boy. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> he would have never had a claim to the throne. Uh -huh. He was a shepherd boy. God chose him and anointed him. God made promises to him. Mm -hmm. This is all about God. Amen. If David's God's king, then God's the one who's going to keep David on the throne. Yes. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. 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 Get it? Yes, I, I remember it was a in my 20s, I guess. I began to experience when I was in, in, employed you know, in the work of the world. There was, there was a time when there were things turned against me. And there were people trying to find fault and this sort of thing. And we got there from since June and I were there, it got kind of, got kind of bad, almost, un, almost unbearable. But there came a, a day of awakening for me. He said, God said, I could just say, just like he spoke it out of heaven, but he said, look, you're my child. You belong to me. You have more than these other people have. But nobody will know that. Unless you stand up to more than they can stand up. Yeah, that's right. Oh, it was a, it was a epiphany. Mm -hmm. A major thing to see. Yeah. So if you're a child of God and you are you're you're not suffering for wrongdoing, let none of you suffer as an evildoer. Yeah, right. yeah. Amen. If you're an evildoer, you got it coming. Don't complain. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But if you're doing what's right and you suffer for it, hmm. you've got to think about this differently than the world thinks of it. Yes. Yeah. Because the, they're watching. Yes. Uh huh. And if you do the same thing the world does, mm -hmm. like where's the witness? That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's, I appeal to Caesar, so you've got to be wise. There's a, there's a time, there does come a time when uh, I've got to appeal to Caesar, but it's because he knew he had to go to Rome, too. See, yes. that's because it makes the, so, mm -hmm. this is very good, to, this, this is very good for the soul, yeah. Yeah. as you're Amen. doing, going through here and seeing David's various responses, how he consistently sides with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if he if he does like in the case of Bathsheba or in the case of County in Israel, if he does, he recognizes. But as soon as he recognizes, he makes reparations. As yes. soon mm -hmm. as he sees what he's done, and it's uh, it's just excellent. Amen. 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 <clears throat> we'll close there then, brethren. And thank you for your participation. I exhort you to cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. Amen. Knowing it, yes. <clears throat> Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the record of David the king and for uh, 
the things that you demonstrated in him, that such a man, that you raised up such a man to show these things. We thank you for your mercy to all of us when you chastise us. We thank you for your chastising, which we need. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, that is uh, that seasons your chastening. We pray that you would continue to bless our gathering today, that we would be uh, continue to be pleasing unto you. We also want to give thanks for the food that we're about to receive. Pray that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen.